Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. You know, it is a lifelong dream for many of us band directors to have a program that would get to a point where we would be able to perform at the Midwest Band and Orchestra Convention in Chicago every December. I have friends who have performed both with jazz ensembles and concert bands, and their programs have been just stellar and out of sight. And this is one of those things that people see as a benchmark to something to possibly attain. Now, not everyone is going to perform there in their career, but it's a huge honor to get to that point. And if anybody hasn't been to this convention before, I highly recommend it. At the same time, if you are a marching band teacher, Bands of America, Grand Nationals, to make top 10 or top five from a marching band side of things is also considered to be really a pinnacle of achievement, let alone to be able to have a program who performs at such a high level year after year after year after year. So it takes a truly special place to do that and a truly special set of teachers to make that happen. And there's a lot of amazing teachers out there who are not in situations where their groups are going to get to Midwest right now or their marching band is going to perform at Bands of America. But there are people out there who are in that position and it's really great to have an opportunity to learn from them. So I bring up both Midwest and Chicago as well as Bands of America Grand Nationals because William Mason High School in Mason, Ohio is doing both of those things within a five-week period. Now let that sink in. Two things that are seminal moments, um, mountaintop moments for band directors and for programs and for towns and cities and schools. This school is achieving it both in the same five-week period. I mean, it's just it's just beyond belief. And I'm really lucky to be able to meet today with Ed Potsman, who is the director of bands at William Mason High School. Now this, in Ed's words, William Mason is a very special place. So I'm really hoping to be able to learn a lot about what makes their program tick, what makes their program so successful. Because even though a, a lot of us, most of us have schools that are much smaller and, and are not able to offer as much, we can still take the principles from great programs like William Mason and apply them to our schools the best that we can. So in our conversation, we're not only going to talk about sort of what led him to be at William Mason, but we're going to talk about the Midwest uh, process. Their performance is coming up on the 19th. If you're there Monday the 19th, you want to make sure you check it out. And so they're preparing for that right now and what it was like to apply and everything that goes along with Midwest and having the great clinicians in to work with the bands ahead of time and, and all of that. I know he's beyond excited for the whole experience. So um, we're going to learn about that. We're also going to learn about the Bands of America um, Grand Nationals and what that whole experience is like and, and the credit that he can give to his amazing staff for putting all of that together because this is clearly something that not just one person can do, right? But, you know, we're going to get a chance to learn a lot. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Ed Potsman. It's uh, going to be really fun.
Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director podcast. I'm very lucky to be spending some time with Ed Protzman from William Mason High School. Uh, I did a little introduction to, to speak about um, what your program is doing and how special it seems to be, even though I've never been there. Um, would you tell us first a little bit about Mason and what's so special about your school and your community? Um, Mason, in, in my mind, is really a special place. Um, it's it's a really unique school. Um, our high school is pretty large for Ohio. It's actually the largest high school in Ohio. It's about thirty six hundred students, mm. and it's also very diverse. Um, so we have a couple of businesses and corporations in town um, that bring in students from you know different countries and cultures. So in our band program, there's almost always you know ten fifteen kids who um, are here for just a bit of time from Japan or from Korea or India. And then some families come and end up staying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it's a cool place from a diversity uh, standpoint. And the community itself really embraces the arts. Um, we have a really super successful band program, but our choir program is also very large and our orchestra program is very large. And the, the leaders of the school at the high school and from the district uh, believe in the arts as an important aspect. And so we get a lot of support, not always financially, but nobody ever tells us no. When we, when we come to somebody and say, we have this vision, we want to do the Rose Parade in 2024, we want to, you know, do this, you know, as long as we present how we're going to make that happen, they're always really supportive. No, no conversation ever starts with no. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that's from all the years uh, that the program has grown and been cultivated. Um, a gentleman named Bob Bass really started it, uh, becoming an incredible program. Uh, they performed at Midwest the first time under him and made it to uh, finals. And then the other thing I think that makes Mason really just an incredible place, at least for me, because uh, this is the first place I've experienced this as a teacher. Our three high school directors, our three middle school directors, and one of our two um, elementary directors are all involved in the marching band mm -hmm. um, and full time. So the, th the three middle school directors that are there, um, Zach Hinson and Aaron Rex and Joe Woody, um, all have aspects of the program that they completely run. And then uh, Jason Sleppy at the high school is the actual marching band director and Avius Jackson um, is the brass person. And I think that's unique because one, we have a lot of people helping each other. And um, two, our students can go from sixth grade up until the high school and maintain contact and communication with teachers that they love. Mm -hmm. And so I think that helps keep Lots of kids in the marching band program and concert program, even though, <laughs> excuse me, even though we we require a lot of hours of practice and things. So it, it's just a unique place where everybody wants to be involved. You know, we don't we don't force anybody to be involved in mm -hmm. all the programs. And it's the same way when the middle school has a concert, all the all the high school band directors go down and help. And when we have we just had a concert band camp this weekend and they all came up and helped. So it's a unique collaboration uh, um, that we have going on. That's pretty great. That's super awesome. So you went, you got to William Mason in 2017. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So what led you there? Um, I have a kind of an interesting story. Um, I did not start out my career at like the big giant program that had, you know, all the resources and all the students. Um, I started out in a really small town in Pennsylvania. Um, and then as I continued my, my career and my learning, um, you know, I'm a big believer in um, personal, de uh, professional development and mm -hmm. continued development. And as I, you know, so as I kept developing myself and my understanding of, of wind band music and, and teaching, you know, I changed schools once in Pennsylvania uh, to a bigger school because I'd kind of gotten to the point with my first school where the things I wanted to do musically and project wise just were a little bit above the scope of what the school wanted to do. And uh, one day I was at my desk and I was on the NAFME website and there was a an ad post about a school in Kansas City that was brand new. Um, and so I, th I thought, wow, that'd be really cool to open a brand new school. So I threw my hat in the ring there and I, I got a really great teaching experience at a school called Blue Valley Southwest outside of Kansas City. 
-hmm. And then kind of the same thing happened. I had always followed Mason. I was to both of their Midwest performances that they had. Um, I remember seeing the their somewhere show at Grand um, at a video from Grand Nationals and just thinking like, wow, that's amazing. And mm -hmm. so I was always just impressed that they had the level of concert band program and the level of marching band program that they had. And I was, I was kind of a Mason fan. And when I saw um, the ad online that they were looking for a new band director, I, I, I was very happy where I was at, but I was like, I can't not try and take this opportunity because I've, I've admired this program from afar for many years. And then I just feel really fortunate that I, I was able um, to get the position and, um, work with the great people that I work with and just be in a place where, you know, band is really special at Mason and the community mm -hmm. appreciates it and the parents appreciate it. So uh, I got there by being willing to throw my hat in the ring. And fortunately uh, they uh, chose me. I was looking up your bio a little bit. Um, it mentioned that you um, were Grammy nominated in 2014. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Yes, I was by a student at my uh, school in Kansas city. Congratulations. That's pretty awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's pretty neat when kids on their own go and nominate you for something because that mm -hmm. shows that all the effort you're putting in is having a great impact. That must have been awesome. Yeah. It was cool. Uh, I also saw, tell me about the George Parks Award for Leadership in Music Education. Yeah. Um, I was really honored um, to get that award. Um it's an award where you have to be nominated by another person um, in the field. And um, I had an incredible experience in my undergraduate degree where I worked with a gentleman named Willis Rapp, um, who used to write all the percussion stuff for what used to be called Jensen Publications back in yep. the day. Yep. Yeah. And, and while I was in school, he had gotten his doctorate in conducting and all that. And he was starting to do more and more concert band things. And, and I was not the best musician when I started school and his, his mentorship and the image that he presented is what really turned on the fire in me to want to be a band director. And um, out of the blue um, in that year, he had just, you know, we've kept in touch and we have a great friendship. He nominated me for um, the award. And then I was fortunate to have a couple of people write me some really great letters. And um, when I was selected, I was really blown away because as we know, you know, George Parks, what he represented for for music and especially students, making students believe in themselves and leadership to be, you know, associated with a name of somebody like that who we unfortunately lost so early in what he he in his career. Um, I, I was just really honored. It was a humbling experience, and um, it was presented um, through. Uh, music for all and Daphne and music for all just always does a great job when, you know, they're taking a band director who's whether you're winning an award or you're just at an event, they always make you feel very special. Um, uh, that's what I've gotten out of, you know, music for all and bands of America. It's not necessarily about the competition. It's they just always make you feel special. So that weekend when I was being presented with the award, they just made me feel great. And it was, it was really cool. And I'm just so appreciative. That's awesome. Um, so those are things that you didn't mention, but I wanted to bring up because I thought those were those are pretty special. Thank you. Um, can can we talk a little bit about how the Mason program is set up, how the band program yeah, is set for up? Sure. Um, so I was doing a little bit of research and I'm probably wrong here, but um, uh, four concert bands or five concert bands? I couldn't really tell. Five concert bands. So how are those set, how are those set up? Obviously, you have a top group and then a second group behind that. Yeah, so our structure is we we have our wind symphony that's performing at Midwest as our top group, and then our symphonic band, um, which um, does really big things too. They were selected to play at our state conference last year. Unfortunately, got snowed out and they didn't get mm. to go. Mm. Um, and then we have our third band that we call Concert Winds, and, and that band tends to be our really a lot of our really excited ninth graders. Um, and so what we try and do with that band is. You know, with with a level of literature that's in the grade three and four area, we try and give them the the full and the full experience of you know encouraging them to audition for honor band and bringing in clinicians and doing all that. And then under that, we have a group called Concert White, um, which is our first band that meets as a full band because our our final band, uh, our fifth band, is actually split. So we call it Concert Green and Silver, and the woodwinds from that class. 
that band meet in their own class and the mm -hmm. brass meets in their own class and then the percussion are dispersed. And the reason we do that is so that those uh, woodwind and brass players that need a little more um, support and guidance can really get, you know, lessons that are directed, you know, right to them and, and their embouchures and their mouthpieces and all the things they have to do. Before that, Mason just had two other concert bands. They had six. And the directors that have been here longer than me really feel like this focusing on the woodwinds and the brass separate in that in that lower band has made a big difference in their in their ability to perform and it's also retained more kids sure sure um do they perform together or separately uh, they do the concert green and silver will have uh two 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 dress rehearsals before a concert and then they'll play together we do that similarly with our we only have two bands but our lower band is a wind band and then a percussion is separate so so we have to do that combination thing as well but you're right it the ability to break them up is a huge a huge asset yeah it really is and we're fortunate in mason our boosters um pay for a full-time uh percussion specialist so in in all the classes our band directors are really spoiled in that we we don't have to start the, the pieces with the kids um we have a guy named john Scharf who does an amazing job with that and so we're pretty we're pretty blessed on that end that's great and lots of kids are taking lessons i saw that it is required to take lessons in a couple of the bands is that true yeah the, in the upper bands it's required but uh, really by that third band, they're taking lessons on their own because they see the other kids doing it. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of really great band programs, it's because of the culture that has developed over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so the culture kind of is that lessons are great. And we're lucky we have lesson teachers that come into the building. So the kids see the teachers and they're like, oh, maybe I'll check out what that's all about. That's great. That's great. All right. Let's get on to Midwest. So how how are you feeling? What are we uh 12 days out? Something Pretty like Pretty much a week, a week and two days out. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's I mean, the Midwest experience is really unique. Um, you know, and if anybody watching this is thinking that they would like to apply, um, I I'm totally open to, you know, a phone call or an email because it really is something you have to set up the audition very carefully and with a lot of uh deliberate choices. Um, so it's really a two year experience. Um, last year, we spent the whole year getting ready to make the recordings and do the audition. Um, and then obviously this year was spent on the preparation. Um, so I was just saying to one of my colleagues today that like, wow, I can't believe in a week, we're going to be at the end of this two year kind of mm -hmm. major project. Um, and, uh, it's going well. I, I, I kind of feel like I'm in a bubble right now where I don't know, like, oh, are they good enough? Are they not good enough? Because I've just been in, in the band room with these same kids for, for so long now working on this stuff. But we're pretty excited. And the best part of it, the preparation has been, we've just had so many great mentors come in. Um, Cheryl and Richard Floyd are both conducting on the concert. So they've been in a couple of times. And uh, a couple of composers, Paul Dooley has been in and some other composers. So it's been a lot of fun. So, you know, even if the concert isn't exactly what we want it to be, which I hope it is, uh, the, this, the experience for the students has already been pretty spectacular. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Um, so you were mentioning about how when you hear them day after day, you don't really know if they're good enough and 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 all this. We're all in that position, right? You could be hearing the, the Eastman Wind Ensemble, but you hear them every day. So you hear all the problems or you could be hearing a really terrible band, but you hear them every day, you know, so like that consistently listening to other groups is a really, really uh, important thing. So it's good to hear that even with a really fantastic group like yours, you deal with the same doubts that we all deal with. Um, uh, I have a good friend named Linda Gammon. I don't know if you know Linda's name. She yeah, is. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's so, been in, to our concert festival. To, so to, to, so you... Linda, Linda's a good friend. And when we were, our when ensemble was performing at the NAFME All Eastern uh, a few years ago. And before she gave me the advice, she said, look, all the band directors in the room, the majority of them are going to be judging your band. And the majority of them are going to think that their bands are just as good and they could have been there. But in the end, they're not. And you are. And don't worry about having a perfect performance. Just enjoy the experience because you don't know when it's going to happen again. That's pretty awesome advice. Yeah. It was like, yes. So what if they have a better band? Like they're not there, you're there. Right. And that's, so I hope, I, I wish I could be there in person. Um, I hope when you perform, you're not counting notes that you're able to enjoy it. Yeah, I do too. Cause it, it really is. 
about the experience. Um, and we've tried to keep a focus on that. We have not like, you know, you know, kind of push the kids harder than, than, than needed. And we've been watching them and trying to make sure that the, their experience and their energy for the music hasn't been diminished by, you know, just doing things over and over again. Mm -hmm. So what are you playing for repertoire? Um, so our big pieces, uh, we're going to open the concert with Laud's Praise I Day by Ron Nelson. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's pretty cool. I've always been a Ron Nelson fan and he's uh, he's a little older now, so I don't think he attends. But I sent him a, an email and he sent us a nice email back thanking us for performing his work. Um, and then the, our second piece is we're doing the three movements of Paul Dooley's um, Masks and Machines, okay. uh, which is that's our grade six it's a really incredibly well-crafted piece, um, really musical, and just every student gets to play something that is unique and slightly different. Um, so we, we're really enjoying that piece, and he was able to come in and work with us. The third piece is going to be conducted by Richard Floyd, and it's a really wonderful grade three by Nicole Pueno, who's an Ohio composer. We wanted to include an Ohio composer. Mm -hmm. Um, and what she did was she took amazing grace and taps and layered them on top of each other and just this really rich and beautiful piece. And I think the people that come to the concert are going to find no matter their, you know, if their, their band is a, <coughs> excuse me, if their band is a grade two, uh, they could stretch and play safely rest. And if their band plays grade six, they could play safely rest and have a super musical um, experience after that piece. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop, your, stop your real quick. Is there a, a story behind that piece? Safely rest. Um, I don't know if there's a story behind it. Um, I know she talked to the kids about how she would use um, amazing grace as a warm up in a school where she taught and she kind of got the idea um, the cool thing about that piece, she shared with the students um, that kind of the story almost came after the piece in that she performed it and there were some veterans in the audience mm. and they were just brought to tears and they they came up and just thanked her for for putting all that together. And it just it just stirred so many emotions in them. And so um, which the students all got goosebumps when she talked about that. It was really um, very um, cool. And so and you mentioned the Floyds. What's your connection with them? Um, well, first of all, um, they are two of the most incredible people I've ever met in that um, they are very open to working with groups of all levels. So we run a really um, a really nice music for all affiliate concert band festival called the Cincinnati Regional Concert Band Festival. And through that, every year we get to bring in you know, six or seven evaluators, and we try and bring in, you know, <coughs> really experienced people. Mm -hmm. And so the floor, uh, Cheryl had been in uh, working on our second stage, which is primarily like middle schools and, and other groups like that. And then the next year, we invited Richard and her to come in. And then the next year, we were like, hey, why don't you come in for four days before the festival and hang out with our kids? And our students and our directors have just um, developed such an incredible musical friendship with them. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing I love about the Floyds is um, they will, you know, anything that maybe is negative going on in your ensemble, you know, they will talk to the kids and you about it with the most uh, graceful approach, but, you know, they will both be honest with you. And I think that's what a great mentor is, um, you know, because, they're going to tell you what you need to work on, but they're also going to tell you the things that you're doing really well. And mm -hmm. if you need help getting to where you're going, they they will they will offer you those resources. So we've just been super fortunate that we've developed this friendship with them. And they're in our program once or twice every year. And the kids know them and the kids feel like they're friends. And it's been really cool. And I, I think mentors are really important. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Great. What's your next piece? Uh, so uh, Avius Jackson, one of our associate uh, directors, is going to do um, uh, Percy Granger's uh, 17 come Sunday mm -hmm. um, after that. And then um, I'm going to conduct a piece by um, 
Evan Van Doren, who's a, a composer and a show marching band show writer out of Texas. He he has a, a really great uh, grade two called Adventure Awaits. And I tried to make sure every piece that I picked had a reason behind it. So like Nicole uh, was an Ohio composer and I had the fortunate experience to actually teach Evan Van Doren in a little tiny drum corps in Allentown, Pennsylvania called the Lehigh Valley Knights when he was 13 because his dad, Donnie Van Doren, the famous marching band Don, uh, drum corps, Donnie Van Doren, wanted him to be in, in march in drum corps, but knew he wasn't ready for an open class group. And then Evan went on and got his degree at Indiana and um, was the drum major of Carolina Crown and he now writes for lots of groups like Santa Clara Vanguard. And he taught um, in that um, Austin area of Texas and had wonderful marching bands that, you know, did great things. And But now he's he's gone on to be a full-time composer. And so mm. we're playing that piece. And that's kind of neat for me, just that connection uh, there to that piece. Um, after that, um, we're doing a piece um, by John Williams, actually. It's... Uh, it's called Escapades for Alto Saxophone and Concert Band. It's from the film score to the movie Catch Me If You Can. Mm -hmm. And so it's we have an alto saxophone soloist, James Bunty, from the uh, conservatory downtown here, the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And then one of my best friends is playing vibes because the solo in that piece is a little different than your average concerto. It's a very bright, happy kind of piece. And the solo is written out kind of like a bebop solo. And mm. so the, the vibes and the saxophone are pretty much mirroring each other the whole time. So it's almost like a it's like a like a cool riff section from you know a bebop tune and uh along with all those wonderful John Williams sounds and shapings. And so it's just an it's an awesome piece. Um and it's very bright. It's gonna be per it's perfect for the middle of the program. And, kind of pep, uh, pep people up a little bit as we're going on. Hmm. Um, after that piece, we're doing a piece called Cook Straight Crossing, which I advise everybody to check out. It is a grade one. It is the best grade one band piece um, I've heard in a long time. It's by Laura Estes. Um, and it, it, it is just, it's so musical for that limited palette that a, a grade one has to has to work with mm -hmm. and so i think a lot of people are going to come away wanting to bring that back to their band rooms uh, it's a really cool piece and cheryl floyd's going to conduct that one um originally our guest conductors were supposed to be cheryl floyd uh, so i'm sorry richard floyd um and professor james Keene, who helped us make our um, audition recording unfortunately uh, professor Keene passed away this summer um, and that was pretty tragic for the for the band because we we really man he's he was just another great person to work with. But when when I thought about well, what do we do with this spot? I mean Cheryl came to mind instantly as the perfect fit. Um, and and it also makes a lot of sense because Cheryl, um, you know Cheryl commissioned so many of those band pieces that fit that like two, three, four grade level. And so her conducting, again, I just think this piece is fantastic. Um, it's going to be pretty cool. Um, after, after that piece, um, we're playing Hands Across the Sea, uh, the John Philip Sousa March. Um, and then a, another great piece by a, a newer composer named Kalijah Dunton. And it's titled Stillwater. It's a grade three and it's it's another really just it, it kind of floats between that line of being um, a lyrical piece, but having some other really interesting aspects, really playable. Um, I think people are going to enjoy that piece. And that's being conducted by um, our third high school uh, director, Jason Sleppy, who is our marching band director. Yep. Um, and then we're going to close with a commission by Onsby Rose titled The Seventh Seal. Um, which is actually dedicated to my father, who was a musician um, and a deacon in his church. That's why it has kind of that seventh seal, has that like kind of almost religious connection. Um, and he passed away a while back. So I, I wanted to dedicate a piece to him. And it's it's a it's a fast, really exciting and invigorated piece. So it, it'll be a good way to end the concert. Sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. Um, what are your travel plans with the kids? It's like, I, I actually did the Google map. You're talking like just under five hours, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's funny when I, when I went to the, you have to go to a meeting in the summer and I was talking to the gentleman from uh, 
the high school for the arts, I think it's Dreyfus that's coming from um, Florida, you know, and he was talking about how it was going to be a pretty expensive full out trip for his kids. We're fortunate um, with being five hours away. We're going in on Sunday. Um, we're going to rehearse, um, go get dinner. And then on Monday we perform. Um, and, and this is the weird thing. If people don't know, the Midwest convention this year clinic is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, yeah. not to, tr not to traditional Wednesday through Saturday. Um, so I feel like the afternoon time on Monday is going to be pretty good. Cause I think a lot of people are going to fly in on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, so the kids perform and then, uh, we're going to let them go around the convention because, I think being a, a student and going into the uh, exhibition hall is probably a pretty mind blowing experience. Just seeing all that. Um, then we're going to go do <clears throat> the 360 tilt experience um, mm -hmm. at the Hancock Tower, and it's it's like this big window, and you lean against it, and then it 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 kind of bends oh. out. Yeah. So uh, we I went on this summer, and my wife actually jumped back and off of it as it started because okay. it's a little scary. And we're going to do uh, Gino's Pizza. And then some shopping the next day and they're going to head out, but I'm going to stay for the rest of the convention. How many, how many chaperones do you need? Um, we have about 10 chaperones, which is probably more than we need for 54 kids. But um, our, our parents are great that way. I won't have to worry about giving out any medications or checking kids in their rooms. Our, here's a unique thing. Our, this might be something, something we'd be interested in creating at their school. Way before me, again, Bob Bass, who started the program, they created this thing called Band-Aids. And the school, we have like these 12 chaperones that the school pays $50 a year. Now, they take it out of our band account, but they officially pay them, which brings them onto the school insurance. And then they take our like video training on how to distribute medicines. And so they're allowed to distribute uh, medicines to students when we're on a trip. So... Us, our band directors get the pleasure of not having to sit there and hand out medications and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty amazing. So we have about 10 uh, chaperones with us. And I assume those 10 chaperones are parents of kids who are in the group mainly. Yes, they are. So how special yeah. is it that those parents get to live? That oh, it's real kids, special. You know? And and we have at least four parents who had a student in the group the last time they went in 2016. So this will be their second student going through the Midwest experience. Wow. And it was pretty cool because when we got accepted and, you know, when you get accepted to something big and you have to go to your boosters and say, well, we're probably going to need a little more money. Those parents were just like, that was the most amazing experience. We have to support this. We have to do it. So it was cool. That's awesome. So in the introduction, I did a couple things before I, I brought you on. I, I mentioned how, how, what an achievement it is to perform at Midwest, as most of us know. But also on the marching band side of things, being you know top five in BOA, um, and the fact that your school has done this on a couple of different times. But I pointed out that within five weeks, you have students who are performing in both of these venues, and man, those kids are going to look back at at such an amazing time and all that. So um, I, I wanted to. We we are uh, running out of time, but what I'd like to do is um, get in a little bit to the the bands of America side of things, and maybe a little bit about yeah. how the marching band goes as well. Um, and, and I also played a clip. Thank you for allowing me of the, uh, it was like your oboe player needs scholarships wh wherever she, yeah, she's going into music for sure. She's f fantastic. I mean, the, the, that oboe solo and behind the video I was watching, I couldn't really see, was that a flute choir? Yep. That was behind. And I also saw alto flute at one point, I believe. Yep. That's our, our, 10th grade flute player who played the alto flute and all those other flute solos. Yeah. It's so, a... so I, I put that little clip on. Cause when I, when I watched your show, I've seen it a couple of times that that moment was just, I, I'm a sucker for just like the really gorgeous musical moment visually and musically. And, and that was it. So thanks for letting us share that. Yeah. This, this was my favorite show. I think I've been involved in, in my career um, just because of the, the artistic level of what we were trying to do visually and musically. Um, it, it was, it was really neat. I can't wait to talk about that. So if I'm not correct, if I'm correct, the top five bands for BOA um, were Avon in a different order, Avon, Tarpon Springs, Carmel, Broken Arrow, and William Mason. Correct. Yeah. We were fourth. So correct. We were, yeah. D I mean, I don't know. The, what a what a prestigious group of bands you yeah. know i mean just to be in like you mentioned being being mentioned with somebody like george parks's name you know 
just these programs are such staple programs. Yeah, it's it's when you're at retreat and no matter where you finish at finals, if you're in finals, you know, you've you've done a pretty amazing thing. And I, I would say the same for semifinals, you know, for some groups, when they cross that line of, you know, the first time they get into semifinals or the first time they get into finals, it's a pretty it's a pretty awesome thing um, to be on the field, though with, you know, the educational teams um, on the sideline as the kids are out there for retreat with, you know, standing next to the teams, you know, the directors from all those amazing schools. You know, there are, there are moments where I have to be like, do I even belong standing here? Like <laughs> these are, these are like real people in this industry. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So how do you guys square? Cause clearly the education of the kids and their musical experience is your first and foremost thing. Um, you can't have a program th- flourish like this in all the areas without that. So how, how do you guys square the competitive music portion of it? Is there, is there like a, a clear approach you guys take to, to the competitive side of things? Yeah, I, I think it, one of the great things that we have, because all the directors are involved in pretty much everything, there's a consistency from sixth grade through our seventh and eighth grade at the middle school, and then through all the bands of the high school, which includes the marching band, there's a consistency of approach to how you play your instrument, the process that goes into starting something, you know, whether it's masks and machines or it's, you know, a BOA finalist marching band program, there's a process to that. You know, you start with the fundamentals, you start to take little steps and you perfect them along the way and you review. And so our, our process to things is pretty consistent. And so when a student joins marching band, it's really, I mean, it's very different obviously than their middle school band class, Mm -hmm. but in their middle school band class, you know, they had big goals. They knew the pieces they were going to play at, at our concert band festival. And they they understand how they broke that down and they did sectionals and they they needed certain fundamentals to make it happen. So we don't switch any major gears when we're in marching band. Um, the other thing that we really like to do is we have a lot of musical friends that we bring in. And so nobody on our staff believes that the way they do something is the way it it has to be done. It has to always be done. Um, So, you know, we bring in, uh, we have Freddie Martin in several times a year and he just gets our kids to play with this really uh, lush brass tone. Uh, And then we have Gino Cipriani come in for a couple of days and he's all about the energy and the approach. And so we just we are always trying to learn as a staff as well. So I just think that the consistency and the students know what to expect. And and I, I think, you know, this kind of goes to I was thinking, you know, what can you say, you know, to somebody that can take away from listening about Midwest or or BOA that doesn't have a program that's ready to do that? Mm-hmm. And I really believe, and I think maybe I'll turn this into a conference, you know. Uh, proposal or something, but I really believe you can have a box five experience, no matter the level or ability of your kids, you know, you can always bring in guests. You can always, you know, make sure that kids are prepared and do the right fundamentals and you can make sure they have some kind of culminating experience. And and I think that's what it's about for our kids. They just, they love the experience of putting it together. um, And then they love the end product when they get to show it off. So they focus on getting good and the numbers to just take care of itself. Oh yeah. We, 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 we don't really talk about like beating someone or uh, because, you know, grand nationals is such an interesting thing because, you know, there, there were probably, and you know, you just have to be honest with yourself. There were probably, you know, 10 bands around the country that could have scored higher than us that just didn't come that year. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, in some years, you know, we're the band that's really well prepared and we're there, you know, so you just have to be good. Um, you have to, you have to understand what the judges are looking for. There's definitely a game, you know, there's a games gamesmanship part of it. Um, and, you know, but if you're going into that and you're investing in going to grand nationals then you've got to be ready to play, play that game. Cause that's, what's going to make you successful. So, yeah, I think we just try and be good and, we don't really, we try and be good in everything we do. And, and that it sounds arrogant, but 
we try and be good in our fifth band. And that just mm-hmm. means we're playing the grade 0.5 piece really well. Correct. And you can do that in everything. Well, once you teach them how to be successful at a younger age, they get older and they're successful at an older age. Yeah. You know, there yeah. are some programs who focus more on their upper level kids than they do their lower level kids. Right. I don't think that's a re- really great recipe, you know, trying to give every kid the teaching they need at that level to allow them to grow where they need to be. Yeah. I heard a really good uh, line one time and, and I think it was on, there's a thing called the Texas yellow board where people post like things. And the line was, how do you make your second band better? We'll start a third band. Um, you know, because then you have kids getting more attention and, you know, but you can't forget about, you got to work harder with, you know, here's the thing. When you have 300 kids in your band program, 20% of those kids are going to be pretty good. And it really has nothing to do with what I'm doing. They're taking private lessons. Their parents have them in all kinds of clubs and activities. So for us to put together a a really great wind ensemble or wind symphony, I mean, it's a, it's a feat, but not the same as it is to get those fifth band kids to be successful. Sure. And that's more important. Sure. So how, how was the marching band set up? Um, I was reading online a little bit on your website, which is quite good. Um, the They're required to take it, am I correct, in as a, a ninth grader? And then after that, they have a choice? Um, actually, they're, they're not required to take it at any point. Okay. Um, they can't be in our top two ensembles in ninth grade if they don't take it. And the reason for that is those top two groups... Uh, usually travel every year. They do a lot of um, intense things. And so marching man is where we really get to share the culture of our program with kids um, in ninth grade, but they don't have to be in it. Um, We're fortunate that our school, if a student is in marching man two years, they get a PE waiver. They don't Mm -hmm. get a grade. They don't get a credit, but they're no longer required to take PE in their schedule. Okay. So a lot of kids will, there are kids that will just take it for two years and decide not to. That's pretty rare, but that is a benefit of being in our marching band. It's all extra quickly. We don't do any marching band during the day. We have never played a note of marching band music inside since I've been there. Um, It's just purely extracurricular, but it's co-curricular in our course guide because they get a grade. um, And then there's that gym class connection. How do they, how do you work out? Are there kids who are also athletes who are performing in in marching band, but also on the football team or things like that? Or is it a separate group of kids? Um, There are some, but um, our school is pretty serious about sports as well. Um, So we find even if we're willing to be flexible, um, what it takes to be a starter on one of our teams doesn't allow for you to miss any um, practices for one of our sports. Yep. And we have a lot of kids, which is fortunate. And we have some kids who don't do marching men because they are like really serious about swimming or cross cross country. And we try and support them in that as much as we can. Sure. So we all, we all deal with the same stuff just on different levels. Yep. Yep. I think sometimes people think at like these big schools, like Carmel, Broken Arrow, Mason, like, you know, magical things are happening and it's not, we were just sitting in our office today going like, Oh my gosh, do we have enough really good trumpets next year to fit? You know, we're, we're worrying about the same things. Cause every time you add a band, then you're worrying about, Oh, do you have enough bassoons? Do you have enough horns? And it's, it's the same. That's right. You know, it's just with me, we have 650 kids in my high school and you have right. 3,600 kids, but look at your percentage. That's pretty good. That's right. That's right. I think our percentages are similar. So feel good about that. Okay. Let's talk about, um, the 2020 show Odyssey. Um, I actually don't know much of the story behind it. I did write down some notes as I was watching it for like the fourth time. Some of the reasons I really liked the show, uh, it was really colorful. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I really like, um, a pretty show, a colorful show, a musical show. It shows the foundation in dance that all the, all the band members are dancing. Um, the use of capes was really, really cool. Um, uh, and again, that oboe solo, the alto, the the chamber music that you guys use within the marching program is quite spectacular. So, um, could you talk a little bit about th- how this year went specifically for you guys? Maybe in the design of that show, or you know, I know you're not as involved as the other directors with the marching band, um, but or how much more credit can you give them, sort of thing? I just want to talk a little bit more about that. Show. Well, um, like I said, we're all involved in marching band equally, but. We're really good about finding whose strengths are, are where they are. And Jason Sleppy, who is our marching band, um, he's our marching band director, especially from the, the creative side and the planning of rehearsals. He's just, he's a, he's really great at it. He loves it. 
Um, and he works hand in hand with uh, Wes Cartwright, who's our show designer. Um, and that's where the 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 ideas come up and, and Wes will present, you know, he's a genius in what he does and he presents his ideas on what music he thinks will work. And then Jason works with him to kind of shape it um, and makes it, makes it come to, you know, total fruition. Um, and this year's show, I felt like kind of what you were saying that it was just fully coordinated um, mm -hmm. and sometimes you start with that idea in mind and you don't really make it to the end but um i just like you said i i also like the colors and the chamber music and i kind of like that it started and it kind of ended in the same place that it started there was a real journey mm -hmm. um, or odyssey within the show um and it wasn't really it wasn't built on any specific thing and it, it was more about you know a journey from beginning to end and and how that happens yeah it was really well developed i i thought well, what were the musical selections that were used um you know we had a whole bunch of different things that came from very unique um sources um so off of the top of my head i can't even pull those up um, okay. there was some some music from that we had found on um, YouTube that we got permission to use. And uh, Jim Wonderlick is our arranger and he did a really great job fusing together all the ideas. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, as you guys are planning ahead to next year, you guys go to BOA every year, correct? Uh, we do. Yeah. Great. So what does the planning process look like for your staff? Um, well, again, um, Jason Sleppy is our head director. And then um, Zach Hinson runs our woodwind program. Avius Jackson runs our brass and Joe Woody runs our percussion program. And so it all starts Jason and one or two other directors, depending upon who it is, will, will go uh, to Texas and meet with Wes Cartwright. Now, normally that happens like in January, February, but we've had the great fortune of being selected to be in the 2024 Rose Parade. Mm. So we have to take deposits on that trip by the end of January. So we have to know what we're doing and all that early. So uh, Jason and uh, Zach will, they're actually flying to meet with our designers, flying back, jumping in a car and driving to Midwest all over next, the course of next weekend. Wow. Um, but again, they love it and that's what they do. They're really good at it. So they, they are in the, excuse me, planning process now because Financially, the Rose Parade is going to be something that we have to be really smart about. So unless we know what the marching band show is doing, we can't really put that plan together. So it's we're going to be ahead of the game this year a little bit. That's great. Um, what was the question I had? Oh, so with your designer being in Texas, um, does he come up to teach in person at all? Or is it your staff that teaches the show? <laughs> yeah, um, again, we have a real guest-based teaching approach. So um, Wes will come in um, several times a season and then Jason will fly and meet with him. Um, Michael Rosales is the person that teaches our dance. And so he'll come in uh, three or four times a year. And then our visual person, Johnny Green, will videotape everything Michael's doing. And Johnny's also one of our band directors, which is really cool to have our visual person be a band director. Mm. So Wes comes in, Jim Wonderlich comes in, Michael Rosales comes in. So um, we're really fortunate that we, as the show is progressing, we have people that will come in and teach a new element or say, oh, that's not really going in the right direction. Let's let's change that and do this or that. That's great. Well, what a great program. I mean, I'm just excited to learn. Can we wrap up maybe with um, some things that we can share with other band directors? We already did a little bit um, about giving every program a five star, uh, oh, sorry, a box five experience, I think was your phrase. Um, what are some tips when it comes to the private lesson program? Do you have any experience with maybe having to be somewhere and starting something? Yeah, um, we're very fortunate with our private lesson program. Um, Bob Bass had it, had it instituted it into the school. And at some point, somebody said, well, wait a minute, you know, how do we have these these teachers coming in that are being paid by students and they're not teachers. But again, at Mason, instead of saying, no, you can't do it, well, they said, well, then how do we do it um, and make it right? So uh, the school um, has a contract the teachers signed. The teachers pay 5% of their income. Now it's on the honor system. 
uh, to the school for rental. And then the school has installed cameras in every one of the teacher's areas so that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, parents can be assured of the safety of their student. And it works really great. But a lesson that, and there's a lot of schools in our area that are not allowed to do it. They're not allowed to bring in teachers to teach and get paid while the school day is going on. Um, and so I learned something during COVID. When we hit COVID, most of our students stayed with their teachers via Zoom. Now, we all know Zoom is not the best option for a private lesson. But what, what's interesting is we came back to school that next fall. And a lot of our private teachers, actually all of our private teachers were not allowed to come back yet. So what we did was the kids still went to the practice room like they were taking their private lesson, mm -hmm. but they went in and used their laptop and took a Zoom lesson. And that made me think, you know, if a school isn't allowed to have private teachers in, maybe they could develop a system where, you know, a kid does three Zoom lessons and then they do an after school live clinic, um, you know, something like that, because you're you're not you're not chained up with those uh, tax things and safety things because the teacher is not in the school. Um, so I would recommend if you can't do it, trying to be really creative. Um, when I was in Kansas, what I did was I was not allowed to have uh, kids pay teachers. So what I did was the kids would give a, a donation into our boosters. And then once a week, I had a flute clinician who came in and worked with all the flutes in whatever band, you know, in each band. And then I had a clarinet clinician come in. And that was another way around. It was kind of a halfway. It wasn't a private lesson. But then a lot of those kids ended up taking private lessons with that person anyway, because they liked them. But I, we always say that we think that our private lesson program is one of the reasons why our kids play so well, because we have sure. great teachers. Sure is. Um, and you mentioned earlier, I believe this too, my wife and I, we teach in a much smaller program, but she teaches them from five through eight, and then I teach them from nine through 12. So we have a cohesive way that we teach them from when they start until uh, the end. And you guys have much more teachers and many more students, but the same approach, it seems like where everybody's sort of on the same the same page. I assume that would be one of your top things when if you're helping somebody maybe get their middle school, high school program in order, maybe they're, you know, they're trying to make some improvements is finding a way to get everybody on on board. Do you have any more any more tips um, in developing some of that cohesive middle school, high school program? Yeah. Um, first of all, again, I, th I think I go I'll go back to um, culture of the program and relationships. Um, you know, I've, I've been in a lot, I think I've done this times where like, oh man, you know, that middle school director, they don't come and help the high school. But then you have to think, well, how many times have you gone down and helped them? Mm -hmm. um, have you taken time to build a relationship and go out to dinner once a month and talk about the band program and encourage them to get more involved? And, you know, so if you go back to relationships and culture, some of those other things can arise naturally out of that. Um, but, you know, when you go in as a new director to just demand that the middle school teacher be at all of the marching band things, that's probably not going to be very successful. Um, but if you can say, hey, when you're having after school rehearsal, I'll come down. And even if it means I'm just helping keep the kids organized, you know, that they may be more apt to want to come up and help you. It's It has to be a symbiotic relationship. Sure. So as we're closing up, some of the great programs, you know, you teach at one of them, you know, what, what do all the good programs have in common? What are, I'm going a little bit off the script here, but, you know, is there something else that, that you see as a really important key to any good program that you are, that you witness around the country? Yeah. Um, I think this goes for bigger or smaller programs. Um, I think the key is that if when you go to these programs, the kids all really want to be there. Mm. Um, and I think it's pretty, it's probably the same. Like if you come to Mason, we do, we have eight kids out of a concert band program of 300 that want to be music majors. So that's not the reason that they're all staying in there. It's the overall experience. Um, I would, I think our kids and I think the kids in Carmel and Broken Arrow would say, Part of it is they want to be with their friends and a really great experience. Um, so I, I think the the underlying you know thing that kind of you see in all those programs again is the culture of the program is in a place where every kid matters in the program, not just the top band kids. Um, 
if you're willing to do the work and rehearse all the hours the marching man's going to rehearse, you're going to get an amazing experience. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these bigger programs, you would, you may be surprised. They're not, they're not kind of working their kids into submission to win a trophy. There's, there's really great rehearsal processes and things like that. Um, and I think we're all becoming more aware of the mental wellness factor of students and, you know, keeping students feeling mentally healthy as well as physically healthy. And I think you'd find that in, in the bigger programs as well. Well, one thing that I really like, you know, when we started this podcast a while ago, Jeff and I, we really liked the the thought of no matter how long you teach, trying to continue to grow and get better. So when you're green, you're growing, when you're ripe, you rot. So, you know, you're somebody who's at one of the top programs in the country. And you talked earlier about your staff is always looking to learn from other people and looking to fly people in and get better because you know it's not about doing it's about doing what's right it's not it doesn't matter who's right right so i i admire that about you and your staff and whether or not they had that or you helped cultivate that in them um that's something that i think students around the country would be better off if more band directors had that approach yeah and i think back to my first teaching position where really i had no money at all and i think i was always waiting to get good enough to bring people in um, and I always thought it had to be like world renowned people. And there were a lot of people in the Allentown area that I could have invited in who would have come in for no money and would have been willing to work with my kids. And I didn't do it. And that's one of my regrets as a teacher now that I see what that does. So, you know, I would say, don't wait, don't wait until your program gets quote unquote good before you start bringing in people and developing these relationships, do it, you know. Cheryl Floyd would come in and work with kids who barely knew how to hold their instruments if they were willing to get better, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't have to be a Cheryl Floyd. It can be, you know, the person down the street who owns a music store is willing to come in and work with your saxophones and whatever it is. So we've talked about a lot of other really good bands too. One final thing. Is there a band we haven't talked about or a band director that people should know about? a program that's not William Mason, but that also does things really well that we should check out on YouTube and other things. Yeah, I think um, if you're going to be at Midwest, I would check out the Las Vegas Academy for the Arts. Um, right. They have a really unique program. Um, he's doing a, a great job. He actually student taught at Mason. The other directors know him really well. I, I don't hmm. know him. Um, but the, that that's a program there that I think is um, really unique and different. Um, I think if you're looking at kind of the the bigger program that, you know, is maybe not recognized yet. It's hard to say because there's just so many really great band programs um, mm -hmm. out there. Um, you know, I really enjoy Bobby Lambert's program at Wando. I think, I think Bobby, you know, you know, Bobby probably. Um, I don't. He, nope. Oh, okay. But yeah, Bobby Lambert um, at Wando, he does a lot of stuff with music for all with their drum major camps and, He's just another great human being. And I think he teaches as a great human being. And that's why his kids love him and want to be in the program. They played at Midwest, I think, two years ago. Um, so that that's another really awesome program. Um, that's from a region of the country where maybe that's not necessarily the norm. Um, you know, we always hear and, you know, we have so much respect for the, the way the Texas system is set up and organized. But you know, every once in a while, you get these bands in these different areas that have really figured it out. And Bobby's program is one of those. Where is that program located? Um, it's either in North or South Carolina. I'm not I'm mm. not 100% sure. Uh, it's Wando High School. And Bobby's just a fantastic uh, clinician. He's a fantastic band director. And above all, he's, he's a really great human being. I assume you're okay with people reaching out to you for questions about anything. How would you prefer? Oh, yeah. You know. I think that's another thing you'll find when you get these directors who, who are a little bit further on in their career that have experienced some things, you know, we're like, we're excited to share. Like, if you know, somebody wants to, you know, talk about how you get to Midwest or how you set up a fundamentals program. I, th I think a lot of band directors love sharing that kind of information. And the cool part of it is, you know, the person who's asking for you to share probably knows something you don't know. So you'll learn something too. Sure. Well, people could find you easily online just by Google yeah. searching your name. Um, they could also contact the show if they'd like, and I'd be happy to put them in touch with you. So, Ed, thanks very much. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. 
If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.